When did a piece of metal become more powerful than a multi-million dollar missile? That moment just happened at sea. Japan recently fired a hypersonic railgun from a warship and punched a clean hole through a real target vessel. Not a simulation, not a controlled lab experiment. A live ship hit with real rounds, producing real damage. And this is what makes it extraordinary. This is the same class of weapon the United States invested hundreds of millions of dollars into, struggled to stabilize, and eventually walked away from. Japan did not walk away. Japan fixed the engineering problems, solved the power and heat limits, and turned a stalled concept into a working weapon. That success changes everything. Every modern military faces the same nightmare scenario. Missiles are becoming faster, more maneuverable, and far cheaper to produce. Defensive interceptors, meanwhile, are becoming more complex and dramatically more expensive. At some point, the math stops working. A single interceptor can cost tens of millions of dollars. An attacker can launch missiles for a fraction of that price. Fire enough of them, and defenses collapse through cost alone. You either run out of interceptors, or you run out of money. Japan's railgun is designed to break that equation. Instead of spending millions to shoot down a single missile, it uses raw physics. Electrically accelerated metal, traveling at extreme speed, no guidance package, no explosive warhead, just kinetic energy doing the work. If this technology scales, missile defense stops being a question of budgets and starts becoming a question of power generation and firing rate. And that is why this test matters. Because a working railgun does not just stop missiles, it threatens the entire economic model of modern warfare. These weapons don't follow ballistic arcs that radar can predict. They glide through the upper atmosphere, changing course mid-flight, flying too low for space-based sensors and too fast for traditional interceptors. China's DF-17 hypersonic missile, operational since 2019, can reportedly evade THAAD, SM-3, and Patriot systems entirely. With an estimated range between 1,800 and 2,500 kilometers and speeds between Mach 5 and Mach 10, the DF-17 forces defenders to react in under 60 seconds from detection to impact. But here's where it gets worse. North Korea reportedly possesses several hundred short and medium-range ballistic missiles capable of striking targets across the Korean Peninsula and Japan. China fields operational hypersonic systems in growing numbers, and both nations continue expanding their arsenals, while defensive interceptors remain scarce and expensive. Even if Japan's interceptors worked perfectly, they face a brutal cost imbalance. Defensive systems will always lose an economic war of attrition against cheaper offensive weapons. Platform saturation analysis shows that a single Arleigh Burke-class destroyer loaded with 12 SM, 6 interceptors, 10 SM-3s, and 24 SM-2s, a total missile defense package worth $202 million, can be overwhelmed by just 15 to 27 missiles depending on engagement doctrine. The cost to achieve that saturation attack? Between 19 and $28 million, roughly 9 to 14 percent of the cost of defending the platform. And then there are drones. Mass-produced attack drones now cost as little as $20,000 to $38,000 each. Ukraine's combat data reveals that drones account for 70 percent of combat casualties in modern warfare. A drone swarm costing $100,000 may require millions of dollars in missiles to neutralize. Israel's Iron Dome, one of the most effective missile defense systems ever built, faced a saturation attack on October 7, 2023, when over 2,200 rockets were launched simultaneously, revealing vulnerabilities in even the best layered defenses. Each successful Iron Dome interception costs approximately $50,000 to stop a rocket worth $500 to $1,000, creating a cost asymmetry of 40 to 100 times in favor of the attacker, that's the strategic dilemma Japan is trying to solve with electromagnetic propulsion. The central question driving this entire program is this. Can a railgun firing $25,000 projectiles at hypersonic speeds replace multi-million dollar missiles? 
and tip the balance back toward defenders? If Japan succeeds, they won't just have a new weapon, they'll have broken the economic model that currently favors attackers in every missile exchange. And that changes the entire equation of modern naval warfare. In 2021, the US Navy canceled its electromagnetic railgun program after spending approximately $500 million over 15 years. The official reasons were fiscal constraints, combat system integration challenges, and a pivot toward directed energy and hypersonic offensive weapons. The unofficial reality? The technology wasn't mature enough. Barrels wore out after a few hundred shots. Power requirements were enormous. Megawatts of electricity delivered in microseconds. Cooling systems failed. And the Navy couldn't figure out how to cram all that infrastructure into an existing warship without gutting half the ship. Japan looked at the same technical problems and took a different approach. Instead of trying to field an operational weapon immediately, Japan's Acquisition Technology and Logistics Agency spent nearly a decade methodically solving each engineering challenge one at a time. Between 2016 and 2022, ATLA focused on two benchmarks, achieving a muzzle velocity of 2,000 meters per second and extending barrel life to 120 rounds without significant rail erosion. By the time they mounted the prototype on JS Asuka, a 6,200-ton test vessel designed specifically for experimental weapons, they had exceeded both targets. The railgun that emerged fires 40mm projectiles, weighing roughly 320 grams, at velocities exceeding 2,300 meters per second, approximately Mach 6.5, or over 5,000 miles per hour. That's faster than most rifle bullets. Barrel life now exceeds 200 rounds, nearly double the original goal. The system still requires four shipping containers of support equipment to handle power generation and thermal management, but ATLA has demonstrated it can operate aboard a naval platform in real sea conditions. In summer 2025, Japan conducted the world's first at-sea railgun test against a moving target vessel successfully striking it at long range with multiple projectiles. Remote operators used cameras and radar to aim the weapon, while drones captured footage of hypersonic impacts tearing through the target's hull. Here's where the railgun fundamentally changes the economics of naval warfare. A conventional missile, whether it's a SM-3 interceptor or a Tomahawk cruise missile, carries an explosive warhead, a guidance system, a rocket motor, and fuel. All of that costs money. A railgun projectile is a shaped piece of metal, possibly with a guidance package, but no explosives and no propellant. Electricity does the work. Estimates place the cost of a railgun round between $25,000 and $50,000, depending on whether it includes guidance systems. Even at the high end, that's 560 times cheaper than a SM-3 and 1,800 times cheaper than a ground-based interceptor. The projectile cost alone isn't the full story. You also need to factor in the electricity, roughly $10 to $15 worth per shot, and the barrel replacement cost amortized over its lifespan. If a barrel lasts 200 rounds and costs, hypothetically, $10 million to manufacture and install, that adds $50,000 per shot in hidden costs. But even with those expenses, the railgun remains orders of magnitude more cost-effective than missile interceptors for high-volume engagements. The second advantage is speed and engagement timeline. Traditional naval guns max out at around 12 miles of effective range. Railguns, depending on design and projectile type, could theoretically hit targets 100 to 250 miles away. While Japan's current prototype doesn't claim those extended ranges publicly, the test firings demonstrated long-range accuracy against a towed vessel, and officials noted the data gathered will inform future anti-air and anti-surface roles. For terminal missile defense, the final, 60 seconds before impact, a railgun positioned close to high-value targets could fire multiple projectiles in rapid succession, creating a wall of hypersonic metal that incoming warheads must survive. Unlike guided missiles, railgun rounds don't need to chase a target. They just need to be in the right place at the right time. 
Between June and early July 2025, ATLA conducted what they called the Shipboard Railgun Shooting Test aboard JS Asuka. The railgun, mounted on the stern flight deck, fired multiple rounds at a target vessel under tow. Operators controlled the weapon remotely using onboard cameras and radar, while drones recorded the impacts. The images released afterward showed clear evidence of damage, hypersonic projectiles punching through the target structure with kinetic energy alone, no explosives required. This wasn't a laboratory demonstration or a land-based trial. It was a full system integration test in a real naval environment with sea states, vibration, electromagnetic interference, and all the variables that sync theoretical weapons programs. The railgun successfully tracked, fired, and hit a moving target at range. ATLA officials stated the trial provided critical data on integration, thermal management, and operational readiness, with direct implications for deploying the technology on frontline destroyers. The significance goes beyond the technical achievement. Japan just demonstrated a capability that the United States shelved three years ago. While the U.S. Navy pivoted toward laser systems and hypersonic cruise missiles, Japan kept refining railgun technology and reached a milestone no other nation has publicly matched, firing a naval railgun from a warship at an actual target and recording the results. That puts Japan in a unique position. They now possess institutional knowledge, operational data, and a working prototype that could inform future collaborations, including potential partnerships with the U.S. Navy, which has expressed interest in Japan's advancement. Japan views the railgun as a cornerstone of its future deterrent posture, particularly against Chinese naval expansion in the East China Sea and Western Pacific. The weapon addresses two specific threat vectors, mass drone and missile swarms, and hypersonic glide vehicles like the DF-17. Traditional interceptors struggle with both and for very different reasons. Drone swarms exploit the economic gap in air defense. A small quadcopter or loitering munition can cost tens of thousands of dollars, while the interceptor fired to kill it can cost in the millions. In a saturation attack, the defender risks spending more in a few minutes than the attacker did on the entire drone wave. Hypersonic vehicles create the opposite problem. They are not cheap, but they are so fast, maneuverable, and low-flying that existing radar networks and interceptor missiles operate at the edge of their engagement envelope with seconds to detect, track, classify, and fire. Even when the physics allow an intercept, the timeline and complexity often do not. A railgun attacks both of these problems at once by changing the economics and the engagement profile. Instead of launching a missile with a guidance package, rocket motor, and fuel, a railgun fires solid metal projectiles pushed to hypersonic speed by electromagnetic force. The projectile is simple and relatively cheap, and the energy comes from the ship's power system, not from a rocket motor. That means a defender can fire many more shots for the same cost as a single interceptor missile. Sustaining fire against drones, cruise missiles, or even hypersonic vehicles without emptying magazines of million-dollar weapons. For the attacker, every additional missile or drone now faces a higher volume of defensive fire, and each exchange becomes less favorable economically. Japan's current missile defense architecture sits on the opposite end of that spectrum. It leans heavily on Aegis destroyers with long-range interceptors and land-based batteries like Patriot all of which are highly capable but extremely expensive and available in limited numbers. Commanders have to think carefully about when to shoot, which threats justify an interceptor, and how many missiles can be expended before a ship or base is effectively naked. Adding railguns as a terminal defense layer around key assets changes that decision calculus. Instead of saving interceptors for only the most critical threats, Railguns could handle a large share of close-in engagements, preserving missile stocks for targets that absolutely require them. If a single railgun can fire hundreds of rounds in a high-intensity engagement at a fraction of the cost of traditional interceptors, the burden of escalation shifts back onto the attacker. To overwhelm such a system, 
an adversary like China or North Korea would not just need to launch more missiles or drones, they would need to launch so many that they could absorb heavy losses to cheap defensive fire and still get enough leakers through to matter. Even then, the defender is spending less per engagement than the attacker, which flips the usual cost equation of modern missile warfare. Instead of defense being the expensive side of the duel, it becomes more sustainable over time. The remaining hurdle is not proof of concept, but engineering integration. The physics of railguns are proven in tests, but shrinking the associated infrastructure is the real challenge. Current prototypes still depend on large power conditioning equipment, capacitors, and cooling systems that can fill several container-sized modules. That is acceptable on a test ship or pier side range, but not on a frontline destroyer where every cubic meter and every kilowatt of power competes with radar, missiles, sensors, and crew spaces. Future generations of the system will have to fold all of that into the hull, draw power from existing generators or integrated electric drive, and operate repeatedly without frying electronics or wearing out rails too quickly. Japan's approach has been deliberately incremental first. Prove the gun can fire reliably at hypersonic speeds, then demonstrate it at sea, then work on size, power, and thermal management. That slow, methodical process suggests they are more interested in a practical, operational weapon than a flashy demonstration. If they manage to compress the system into a footprint and power budget suitable for a standard destroyer class while maintaining barrel life and rate of fire, they will cross a threshold no other navy has reached. At that point, Japan would not just have a new gun, it would have the first naval railgun that makes missile defense economically sustainable over long campaigns, with the potential to reshape how every major power thinks about offense, defense, and the future of high-intensity warfare at sea. Support the channel by liking and sharing this video, and subscribe to stay informed about the next wave of technological innovation.